Hi, this is Miss Litton. A little confused because I don't know where everybody else is, but I have a lovely, lovely, bright, and wonderful small group. Say hi. Hi. There's like 10 of us. Where are you guys? I shouldn't even post this video. Okay, um, so we're talking about Darwin and evolution. So the first part, we just kind of went over like what Darwin did in his trip and some of the things that he saw on the HMS Beagle, things that he looked at, like, um, contrasting environments so he would say oh look it's a desert environment look what kind of organisms are there it's a lush forest look what kind of organisms are there look at these organisms that look similar to each other an ostrich and a rhea from two different continents yet so similar um, look at these mountains they have seashells up on them this must have changed over time um, what kind of organisms could live here hello and then also looked at organisms that were endemic, like these marine iguanas that only behave this way at the Galapagos Islands, or looking at these finches and the tools that they use. So these were some of the things he looked at. And then we went over in class just some of the history that um, kind of preceded Darwin. He was not the first to talk about descent with modification. He was just the first one to give a good mechanism for the process of descent with modification. So we looked at people like Linnaeus, and we still know him and want to know him for binomial nomenclature. Um, but he believed in fixity of species, even though he studied all of these plants. We looked at Leclerc, who wrote this 44 volume history of all plants and animals. And he did speculate on these things. He wouldn't commit to the idea of evolution, but all of the things he speculated about are pieces of evidence we use today um, to support evolution. We looked at Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, a physician. He did suggest the possibility of common descent. He just did not have a mechanism for it. And again, all of these items, um, animal development, artificial selection, vestigial organs are all used as pieces of evidence today that you want to be comfortable with. We looked at the father of paleontology, Cuvier, and yay! We looked at, did you see our pose? No. Oh. Um, we looked at Cuvier, um, and he did look at paleontology, but he believed still in fixity of species. He would say, yeah, I know it looks like organisms are changing over time, but they're not. What's happening? What's happening? What did he say? Yeah, some catastrophe is wiping them out. So it looks like they're changing. They just don't exist anymore because some catastrophe happened and something else is replacing it. Okay, um, and then we looked at Lamarck. And Lamarck, he was all in. Okay, he said definitely there's evolution, but he was off the mark because what he used for the mechanism for evolution he did believe that there was change over time but he used the idea of use and disuse and um, inheritance of acquired characteristics so an example of that would be if till started going you know what i'm hitting the gym every day i want to bulk up and i want to be a professional wrestler so till hits the gym he has ginormous biceps and quads what does that tell you about till's uh, children, what should they look like? Yeah, they should be as strong as he is, right? Because he acquired that during his lifetime and he would pass that on to his offspring. But we know that that's not how it works, right? We know that what would, what would, what's the big two word description we would use that Darwin gave for the mechanism? Natural, Natural selection. Nature selects who's best, those are the ones that are surviving and reproducing. We also looked. Um, when he was on his journey, he was reading some books. And so um, he was reading a book um, from Charles Lyell. And did you see our post? What? Nobody sees our post. But we made a post calling all ages. Our dad's oh, okay. Um, Charles Lyell, um, he wrote a book. He uh, published Hutton's um, idea about that the earth was old. Um, and he and this was called Principles of Geology. And this was great because time is one of the key things you have to have in order for nature to select because it has to happen over a series of generations. What's another thing? You've already learned it. It's critical for a natural selection, that mechanism, besides time. Variety. Variety. You've got to have variations. And, yeah, you do have to have competition amongst them. Not all of them are going to survive. Good. You understand it well. 
Um, so one thing that Lyell said was that there was this theory of uniformitarianism, that you would have these regimented changes in the, in the environment over time. Darwin didn't buy into that, um, but he still liked the idea of this old earth because that helped support his ideas of natural selection. Um, another um, one uh, that he had and is that, you know, to help him um, kind of frame natural selection was this idea that individuals struggle to survive. If they're low in money, they're low in food or famine, there's a struggle for existence. Um, and so that can that contributed to his thinking as well. So here's Darwin. The big idea is change over time. So it could be cha geologic change, change in uh, rock, the earth, or biological change. The reason why some people get really upset has to do with the species definition. And we have a whole chapter where we'll talk about that. But it's the idea that forming new species as opposed to God creating each and every individual species. Um, so um, we're going to learn that the species definition is very fluid, okay, about like where you call a species. We'll, and we'll discuss that in a later chapter. But that's some of the pushback. So again, he looked at seashells um, and um, that was a piece of his evidence. We talked about biogeography and that is a big piece of evidence for evolution that we're going to talk about tomorrow as well, but you'll have already pre-learned it. And the biogeographical evidence just basically says, can an organism get to a new location? Can it survive there? Does it have the adaptations that it needs to survive there? If species are separated, then you're not going to see any kind of interbreeding between those species. Like the reason why we don't have giraffes and elephant, elephants here, those evolved after these continents were separated. And so you can get unique species per these large geographical areas. So that's biogeographical studies. Um, oh, one other one. When the continents were together, if the, when the continents were together, then species that were evolving at that time would be found uniformly on all those species because the continents were joined. But you see unique ones once they've been separated. All right. Um, he also looked at fossils. He looked, he said, okay, there's a fossil, looks like a sloth, maybe it's related to the sloth, or it looks like an armadillo, so maybe it's related um, to an armadillo. Um, he looked at things that looked like an amalgamation of different items that were unique to certain areas, and he wondered if where they descended from um, or had similar adaptations to other organisms living in that same environment. And then, of course, the tortoises. And I, I think this is such an easy piece of evidence to see besides vestigial structures is comparing and contrasting just the shape of um, you know the the shell it, obviously they're changing over time because those who had access to grass and plant material that was on the ground they didn't need the arch but those who lived in an area where there was no vegetation on the ground they would select for this arch and more than likely there was a common ancestor to all of these but the environment selected which tortoises survived and lived and flourished on in that particular area. Okay, did I go too fast on anything right there? Are you okay? I think it's pretty easy to understand. I'm kind of just whipping through it here. Okay, then we're looking at some of these specialization or endemic species where you only find it there and things like um, the way the, um, um, the penguins were smaller in size or these specialized, these birds with their different colored feet, uh, lengths of beak, um, uh, what they ate, um, just that are specialized to that particular area and you don't find them anywhere else. Um, what are these guys? Yeah, iguanas. And so nowhere else do you find them swimming in the ocean or eating algae, but you do find them here because if they wanted to survive and reproduce, that's what they needed to do. So they had those adaptations. We looked at um, all the finches, and we know that wherever you had increased what? Competition. competition, yeah. When you have increased competition, then you're gonna see the need, right, to exploit different aspects. If there's not enough medium seeds, and your beak has, happens to be due to a mutation or something a little bit smaller, so you can eat the smaller seeds, then that's something that's gonna be selected for and other birds with the smaller beaks. 
so that they can exploit the smaller seeds, seeds and vice versa the larger seeds, right? So if your beak is a little bit bigger and you have the power to crack those big seeds, then you're gonna exploit that and then you don't have to compete for the medium seeds. So that's just repeated over and over again and then you get all these variations and here's a picture of them here as well. All right, so Darwin did finally publish The Origin of Species, but who pushed him to publish? Wallace, Wallace yeah. So Wallace was um, studying um, on, a, on his trip in the Amazon. He came up with all of the same things that Darwin came up. It's just almost two decades later when he was coming up with these items. All right. And when he, he's like, I show up. Um, when he came up with these items, and he, remember, he sent his essay to Darwin to proofread and to give suggestions on before he went to publish it. And Darwin's freaking out and saying, oh my gosh, I've thought of this forever. They jointly published an article, and later um, Darwin published this book, The Origin of Species. And to this day, because one of the things that Wallace talked about were these geographical regions, so you could explain why you would see certain organisms living in certain areas, that would be biogeography. Hi, come on in. May I? Yes, you may. I've got a crowd. You do? Yeah. Okay. Come, come on in. in. Okay. Go in. And Are you doing a tour right now? Can I tour them really quick? Okay. I'm going to pause you just for a minute. Fill in all the spaces. Go all right. So we had a little interruption there, but we are back. Um, moving on. Yes. Did you ask me a question? Oh, no. They're just talking. Okay, so when you do your debrief for natural selection, this is really the best thing you can do to put in your debrief is this particular slide, because this kind of summarizes up natural selection, right? So this whole thing that nature doesn't need to select anything if there is, an, if there is not an overproduction of young, because that is what one of you was saying over here about competition. Not everybody's going to live, not everybody's going to survive, so you're going to have a struggle. Some of those are going to be more adapted than others um, in order to make it to the next generation. So that's this part. Um, then we looked that variations is key, there's going to be competition to survive. And when we talk about fitness, you want to make sure you understand that. When you talk about fitness, it's your ability to contribute to the next generation to pass your genes on. Remember, individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. So when you talk about fitness, that's a personal fitness that that organism has, right? But overall, those who are able to pass their genes on the best are the ones that are more likely to survive and reproduce. Um, we also talked about um, convergent evolution. Um, convergent evolution, in a nutshell, is two different organisms not related um, resolving the problem of their environment in the same way, right? Two different organisms not related solving the problems of their environment in the same way. So you're like, I wanna move to this environment, I'm gonna fly. I'm gonna move to this environment, I'm gonna swim, you know? Um, I too am gonna harvest pollen from flowers. And I'm gonna be a pollinator. I might be, this one might be a bat, and this one might be a bee, and this one might be a moth but they're all kind of serving that common role, okay? So that would be convergent evolution. A piece of evidence um, that Darwin used was artificial selection. So we can see that within quickly in several generations, if you have birds, a horse, dog, plants. So if we can do that quickly, why couldn't nature make some major changes over longer amounts of time? And we saw that here. Here's an example of artificial selection in plants, and they look very, very different. Um, and then we went into uh, parallel evolution. So these are all underneath the heading of mammals. So they are distantly related in the sense that they are all mammals. But the parallel part was, is that they kind of ended up looking very similar to each other and solving it in the same way. This is different from convergent. This is because they did have a common ancestor and they do uh, have solved it the same way. You're eating a ant eat, you know, we've got an anteater that looks like this, and then this numbot who also eats ants, you know, similar, you know, a narrow face, etc. So, a mouse and a marsupial mouse. 
you know, they, they evolved on two different continents, yet they look so similar. So that is referred to as parallel evolution. Okay, and then we just started talking about this lovely, terrible slide, evidence of evolution. And we're gonna hit that again tomorrow in class and I'll review that, but fossil evidence, right? We looked at fossils. What was this one right here? Biogeographical, anatomical. And underneath the anatomical, we talked about that you have homologous structures where they look the same, right? Come from the same structure itself. They may have different functions. There could be vestigial structures, um, like the hip bone in the whale, um, your ability to move your ear. It's pointing to your ancestral past. And then also um, you have developmental, like during development you can look very similar. Then there's also developmental, okay, and that's where you're comparing the actual genes that code for the development, those Hox genes and how similar they are. And then biochemical is things like DNA and RNA and the genetic code and coenzymes and cellular respiration. And then we'll hit those uh, pieces of evidence tomorrow in class. We good? Any questions you wanna ask? You did a good job for the tour group. Thank you very much. Yes? No, I just want you to do it from somebody in your class. Okay. Yeah. It's just, it's really, things get lost in the grading when it's too different. Okay. It's kind of a pain. Okay, what else? Anything else? I'm assuming you don't want me to review this because we haven't gone over it. If you want me to review it, I will. Yeah, we'll review in class. All right, all right, good. Okay, have lovely days. We miss some of you.